The Fujio cent, the first one cent coin minted in the United States in 1787, had by far the best slogan one could possibly have on the currency. Mind your business. That's the essence of freedom. The world would be a much better place if more people would just mind their own business. And minding your business is the essence of discretion. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. A month or so ago, I got a comment on my video about my own childhood being now illegal in this age of pampering, overprotection, lack of responsibility and extended childhood. The comment reads, quote, You are very secretive, but you have a Romanian accent. Me too. With the implication, of course, that I'm trying to conceal the fact that I am Romanian. Now, without overreading too much into this type of comment, it does, however, re however, reveal an underlying mentality that is very common amongst present-day youth, namely that anything outside of total narcissism and speaking non-stop about yourself is somehow dubious and secretive and almost bad in itself. Minding your business and speaking more about ideas and less about yourself as a person is far less popular today than was 20 years ago. And this is further accelerated by the identity politics trend heavily reinforced through the cathedral media and the academe. And the more special snowflakes graduate from there, the more of this mentality we get into the culture. It's a downward spiral that makes the culture dumber and, by extension, most of us as well. Now, I don't exactly subscribe to the idea that this is necessarily a deliberate result of a conspiratorial effort, but it is nonetheless true that the fact that this is happening comes in very handy for those holding totalitarian worldviews, whether it's feminist, Islamist, socialist, it doesn't really matter. All totalitarian agendas are far more easily forwarded when you have a populace that is not accustomed to minding its own business and rather accustomed to being dependent on higher forces, especially a government. It is thus my contention that discretion is, in and of itself, a virtue and it falls under the responsibility of the individual to practice it and safeguard it. The lack of this virtue or a significant weakening of this virtue within individuals can and usually does have severe societal consequences that ultimately lead towards a less free society in a thunder of applause and in the name of openness. Now let me explain this through examples, because real life examples drive the point home much better than the abstract philosophical discourse. Let's take for instance the issue of surveillance cameras in cities. Now, quite a sizable amount of people, perhaps even a majority at this point, accepts Orwellian surveillance in cities as normal or even necessary. And I'm not talking about private surveillance here, such as a bank placing surveillance cams or other private establishments taking measures as they deem fit. That's not the issue here. What I'm talking about is CCTV style of uh, surveillance, namely taking money from all the people to then spy upon everyone's moves in the public space, which gives the power to the authority of knowing virtually all the moves of every single individual at all times. The existence of such a system is argued in terms of necessity as it allegedly reduces crime and makes police work easier. But is that even true? Well, one way to measure this uh, is through direct comparison. The last quality of life survey made by the European Commission in 2013 found that the city I live in, Cluj-Napoca, to be the best city to live in out of the, 20, of the 79 European cities and four urban agglomerations included in the survey. On the question of safety, the list of the first 20 safest cities 
include exactly zero cities from the United Kingdom. Newcastle comes as the 21st, Manchester as the 44th, and London as the 48th. Now, the reason I'm comparing with the United Kingdom is that most of the top 20 safe, safer cities in Europe are also cities with very low level of public surveillance. You have to walk quite a lot until you find one surveillance cam in this city, and most of them are pointed towards the roads, not the sidewalk. So it's fairly easy to walk around and be discreet. Same is true in Ljubljana, or was true last time I visited, which is a city that was deemed as being even safer than the city I live in, though not by much. So now you tell me, if a high level of public surveillance indeed does reduce crime, shouldn't the cities with the highest level of public surveillance be the safest ones? And conversely, shouldn't the ones with little to no surveillance be crime-ridden hellholes? Because while correlation does not imply causation, the reverse is true. Causation does imply correlation. In other words, the fact that the most spied upon cities tend to be less safe than cities with a smaller level of spying should tell us that CCTV, CCTV type of surveillance doesn't exactly do much in terms of reducing crime. This inverse correlation does not imply, however, that the existence of CCTV is responsible for the higher crime rate, so let's be clear on that. Now, what's that got to do with minding your own business? Well, every time I bring this up to the defenders of high levels of spying, uh, they suddenly do drop the facade of being concerned about safety and cut right to the chase with retorts to the effect of, well, so what? It's the public space. Why are you so angry? Only those who have something to hide have reasons to oppose public surveillance. I'm sure you all heard this argument in various contexts, and the argument is correct, in a way, just not in the way its utterers think it is. Yes, I do have something to hide, and you have something to hide, and everyone has something to hide. Those who claim that they have nothing to hide, I invite them to make their computer hard drive public, as well as the contents of their phones, and re release their bank statements, you know, WikiLeaks style, and you get my point. One way or the other, everyone has something to hide, including those who insist they don't. But the fact that the virtue of minding your own business has been so severely weakened in recent decades makes way too many people oblivious to the fact that this applies to the government and other authorities as well. Why should the government know that I went from point A to point B? Why should the government have the power to find out in a matter of seconds whether I did indeed travel or not, without prior probable cause and a warrant issued by a judge? Why should the government have this kind of power? In other words, why should the government be allowed to stop minding its own business and commence minding mine? That's why discretion is such a virtue. Because once one adopts the mind your business lifestyle, a liberty-oriented worldview is bound to emerge almost in an instant. Once one understands the importance of being secure in one's person, houses, papers and effects, as the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution would put it, once one grasps that, there's no way one won't eventually reach to the conclusion that liberty is preferable. And yes, I do agree that liberty is the hard way, and discretion is a, is a difficult virtue to hold, but it is the right way. The alternative is easier, but on the long run, it simply ends bad. Now, as I routinely say, quoting Thomas Sewell, there are no solutions, but only trade-offs. For instance, you could stamp out drug consumption if you would mandate surveillance cams everywhere, including in people's bathrooms. The problem would indeed be solved, but is the trade-off worth it? Similarly, you could stamp out crimes by doing away with due process and presumption of innocence, but is the trade-off worth it? Some totalitarians, such as the feminists, argue that the trade-off is worth it, at least in some cases. But why stop at some cases? A principle is good only insofar as it can be close to universal. Otherwise, it's unsound, to say the least. 
And make no mistake, there is no totalitarian on the face of this earth who doesn't believe that the presumption of innocence is bad. Similarly, there is no totalitarian on the face of this earth that doesn't believe that discretion is bad. And the reason is precisely because discretion is evidence of individuality. An individual practicing the virtue of discretion is an individual who is far less likely to self-censor, far less likely to swallow collectivist bullshit, and less likely to be willing to help the state in any way, shape, or form. Now, notice that I said less likely and not far less likely when it comes to helping the state. And the reason I said this is because discreet people are also more likely to, spo to spot actual danger as opposed to phony bollocks. Again, let me give you an example. If I had known for sure that a neighbor is breaking the law by smoking weed or hiding cash away from the state, I would have never said anything to anyone, least of all the state. That is because I regard income tax as institutionalized theft and fundamentally immoral, and I believe that the government should mind its own business when it comes to weed. However, if I had known for sure that my neighbor is preparing a bomb to blow up the city hall, I'd be the first to offer my help to the state in preventing that from happening. That is also because government should mind its own business. It's just that one of its business is to make sure nothing blows up all of, the, all of a sudden. Sadly, societies in Europe today work on the exactly reversed principle than uh, what I have just laid out. In many countries of Europe, Belgium included, there are financial incentives to rat out your neighbor if he doesn't pay the extortion, <coughs> sorry, I mean the income tax. But in the same Belgium, there are no incentives nor cultural pressures of any kind to say something when your neighbor is sheltering a terrorist. That's how it was possible for Salah Abdeslam to live for four months right next to the European Commission while everyone was looking for him in connection to the Paris attacks. It's quite literally an upside-down value system. Now, you will notice that while these traits can be noticed all over Europe as well as North America, they do vary in intensity from area to area. And the biggest variable seems to be the level of de facto liberty. And what determines uh, how much de facto liberty there is in a place seems to only rely on how much are individuals willing to be discreet. That this may not be the only factor, but I'm sure it's a contributing factor. Case in point, Hungary. Now, Hungary has quite a plethora of batshit crazy laws and regulations that are generally unheard of in the surrounding countries. Yet despite this aspect, the level of individual freedom one can enjoy in Budapest far outstrips significant chunk of Europe. Now, why is that? Well, after many trips there, I think I know the answer. It has a higher concentration of discreet people. In Budapest, you won't meet too many locals being willing to talk about themselves willy-nilly, not even with other locals, not in public anyway. Once you get past that and get to the discreet life of the town, it's simply a different planet. It's the planet where you can buy anything from the unregulated market, the planet where you can smoke weed in better conditions than in Amsterdam, the planet where you can think, say, read and do pretty much whatever you please, as long as you don't severely harm anyone else. It's the planet where people mind their own business. Now, the reason I gave this example is because I think it's the shortest and easiest path towards advancing liberty faster and long before the general culture and systems of governance do change. You know, just adopt discretion and adopt a mind-your-own-business lifestyle. Now, there is downsides to this, namely the responsibility of safeguarding your own privacy. Nobody will be there to guard your privacy, and if anything, there's plenty of people willing to destroy it. But then again, I never claimed liberty is an easy option. I just claimed that it's the superior option. <sighs> anyway, so this is essentially what I practice when I avoid speaking at length about myself and prefer, prefer speaking about my ideas. 
unless it's relevant to making a point, I would rather keep things about myself private, not necessarily because I'm afraid of something, but out of principle. The principle of minding my own business. And with that being said, thank you for watching and for supporting this channel. I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.